Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. I'm really excited to bring the Gravestone Girls or girl <laughs> to you today, um, where we're going to be talking about gravestones, Lexington, history, art, sort of like a lot of stuff that we all love. Um, but before I get to that, I wanted to um, start out by saying we are partnering with, the, um, with this program with the Lexington Historical Society. And here with us today is Sarah McDonough, who is going to just talk for a minute about what they're up to over there. Hi. So um, welcome, everyone. I've just put this up on our Facebook page. So if anyone is watching on Facebook, I will be keeping track of any questions and shuffling them over here. And I'm just so happy that Mina has asked us to partner with her again on this lovely program that I've seen a couple times before. It's amazing. Um, our next program with the library is going to be uh, in another month. We are going to be joining the library for a book club meeting uh, with Native American chef Lois Ellen Frank. So I'm very excited to talk about historical food a little bit more uh, for Thanksgiving. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, we're really looking forward to that too. Um, so much interest in both food and history. Um, so as um, Sarah said, we are recording this as well as having it on Facebook Live. So um, you know, people can ask questions there. Here, if you're gonna ask questions, we're gonna wait till the end to ask them. Um, Brenda's got a presentation that she's gonna go through and I will um, definitely be paying attention. So you can put your questions in the Q&A or in the, uh, and use the chat for technical issues or any comments that you might have. And I will share those with, those friend, with Brenda afterwards. Um, I'd like to thank our library, Carrie Library, Carrie Library, <laughs> a long day, Carrie Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programs. We could not do this without them. So the Gravestone Girls, Brenda Sullivan is one of two. Um, they are super interesting and they go to different communities and learn all about their gravestones and talk about the history, the art, the, they used to have, they do have some rubbing classes and, um, and things like that, which is fascinating to me. And they've actually taught me quite a bit because I did see Brenda. Brenda came to a different library that I worked at a few years ago. And I just learned a tremendous amount about the gravestones in that community. So what I'm really looking forward to today is learning about an overall picture, but also about Lexington because Lexington has such a rich history already. Let's learn about their graves, uh, the gravestones. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda. Welcome Brenda, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much, Mina. Um, and my thanks also to the Historical Society tonight for having us. There's only me that you see, but there is an us, and I'll talk about those lovely ladies in just a minute. So I think I've got it up on Facebook Live on our side, but all this technology, I'm learning as I go. So I think y'all see me out there, in here, and every place else. So let me get my screen up for you and we will do this. I think that is exactly what we'll do. So welcome to the graveyard. This is your tour of cemetery art and history and symbolism with the gravestone girls. And I knew that was gonna happen because I shared the wrong one. Let's do it from here. This is what I have a web mistress for. She takes care of all this stuff. All right, let's see if that one will work. Yeah, there we go. So there is indeed an S on the end of that. Gravestone girls, there is more than one. Uh, in the left is a shot of the three original OGs in their natural habitat. Uh, that's me with my sunglasses and my purple boots on, um, my web mistress, Melissa, better known in the virtual world as my social media evangelist mistress, web mistress, Zipporah. She keeps us looking good online. And then seated is my unconventional conventionalist, Maggie. Uh, Mag and I grew up in central Massachusetts. Melissa grew up out in Western Mass and together and separately over many years, we've traveled many cemeteries all over the world. The Gravestone Girls mission is to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history 
So shameless self-promotion, www.gravestonegirls.com for all your Gravestone Girls needs. Gravestone Girls do a bunch of different things. We do public presentations like this, a lot of educational uh, discussions. And we lead cemetery tours, real live walking tours. Uh, you remember that? You remember go outside? Uh, we actually might try to do one before the snow flies in November. So watch for that. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner, you will see an example of gravestone rubbings. That is something else we do. We teach gravestone rubbing classes. And I am not gonna talk about that this evening. It's a whole conversation unto itself. Um, but know that a properly executed gravestone rubbing is a completely inert process, but that's really the, the caveat there. It must be properly executed and there is a way to do it safely so that you don't harm the stone. Uh, and down in the lower right hand corner is an example of our gravestone replicas. So these are the castings that we make. They are, come from the art found directly on the faces of original colonial New England gravestones. Uh, these are elements of the larger stones that still sit out on the cemetery landscape. Everybody has a hook on the back so they can hang on the wall and be decorative inside your home. We also have a line of magnets mirrors, picture frames, pin boards, and we always create new things all the time. So you can shop online and see us out at a whole bunch of different virtual markets and new markets too. So before we get going, we need to answer two basic questions about the origin and the evolution of the cemetery. Why do we bury the dead and where do gravestones come from? So we bury the dead because we're human. And we only have a certain amount of time while we're here. And when our life ceases, we must do something with the mortal remains. So we dig a grave, we put the body in the grave, and then we cover that grave with stones. And early on, it was a pile of stones, multiple, more than one. And that is where the word gravestone evolves from. And it is the idea that we put stones on that grave as a way to know where we put someone in case we want to go back and visit or memorialize. Uh, we put stones on that grave to show where we've put someone. So when it comes time to inter someone else, we're not disturbing those that are already buried. And then the last and very practical purpose was to keep wild animals from turning that freshly, freshly turned earth that is the grave. So the archaeological record going back 50,000 years or more uh, will continuously show that different societies in different places all over the world held belief systems that said there was another world after this. We go somewhere else after this, after we die and leave this world. And we know that because archaeologists and, and their kind are as they dig up civilizations, they find things like this a picture in the upper right hand corner. This is a very simple grave, but in the grave, you see vessels inside. Those vessels may have contained food, oils, beads, something that would be needed for the deceased in the next world. And these grave goods and graves can be very simple like above, or they can be very elaborate, like the picture down below. Aren't those big pointy things really just big old gravestones? They mark the spot where Pharaoh is buried and they contain wonderful things that Pharaoh needs for the next world. Now I can talk about 50,000 years worth of history, but we don't have that kind of time. So I am going to take us on a tour through the three major eras of graveyards and cemeteries that, and because there is a difference, um, from first settlement, the 1600s to the 1700s. So the upper left-hand picture is a, a very good representative photo of that type of landscape. We will walk on into the rural garden movement of the 19th century as depicted on the upper right. And then we're gonna take a look down in the modern cemeteries of the 20th and the 21st century. And the content you will see tonight is from a, number of field trips that I've taken over time into Lexington and uh, built an original program on this subject matter about seven years ago and presented at the library. And uh, you'd think that this space doesn't change over time, but it actually does. So I've taken the basis of that program from the first time I presented it, 
dusted it up a bit, added some new information. And what you'll see tonight is mostly from the Lexington burial grounds and cemeteries. I will tell you now, and I'll remind you again when we get to the modern section, I took pictures in all of the cemeteries in town, including graves of the modern, of the modern cemeteries. So when we get to the modern section in this program, we may run into some folks that you may recognize on screen uh, by their gravestones. I have tried to, to shield the identity as much as possible for privacy, um, but it is entirely possible that you, you will see something you recognize. Know that I'm not trying to count anybody out, single anybody out. I'm trying to use examples that I find in the modern cemeteries to talk about, it, or to show you what we as modern people think about memorialization and our own mortality. And using them the same way that I use the examples from the colonial and the rural periods that we see in the previous sections. So Lexington was originally part of Cambridge as Cambridge Farms incorporated as Lexington the town in 1713. You have five burial grounds and cemeteries uh, dating back to the first one in 1690 and all the way up to a new lawn cemetery in 1921. And like I said, we'll see examples from pretty much all of them. You will, you'll see examples from all of them. So this is the colonial landscape in downtown Lexington. This is out by the UCC church. It's out behind. It's just off the green. The church is just off the green and the burial ground is behind that. When you see this space, this type of colonial burial ground, know that what you are looking at has absolutely changed over time. There's a number of ways to tell, and one of them is, is a good example here because we've got these nice organized rows. Over time, this space gets encroached. Uh, often when it is located in the middle of town, it's some of the oldest land to be first developed. As town grows and changes over time, we put in buildings where there were no buildings before, or we put in roads that didn't exist or widen existing ones. That will eat into the landscape here. The way we tend the grounds as modern landscaping evolves, um, that affects the way this space gets reorganized. We have different periods of time, just from aesthetic point of view, people will come in and say, well, we got to tidy this place up. So those and many more um, are factors that influence the way this space looks to our modern eyes nowadays. And Lexington has a really good example of that at the old burial ground. And know that when you're looking at my slides, they'll all be captioned. And the, the first line will tell you what it is we're looking at. So here we're looking at obvious changes. These are cues that we know this space has been reorged. Um, and then underneath it'll say the name of the burial ground and, uh, or cemetery in town that, that the images were taken from. So I got really tired of typing old burial ground, old burial ground, old burial ground. So we've just shortened it up to OBG. So this, these are two really fabulous examples of how the colonial burial ground gets changed over time. Uh, so we saw those nice neat rows in the, in the first example. And now in the upper left example, we've got a, a, a half circle, a demi luna, they've all been lined up and they go around the corner. And then in the lower right hand, they actually are perpendicular, two rows have been put perpendicularly to each other. This is a huge clue that this space has been reorged. Um, I do believe I was told that, so if you go into this burial ground, you will find at one section, there's a, a, a pathway that's been put through and you'll note that a lot of the stones get put along that pathway. That's where these half circles come from. Uh, and at that change, if I am recalling my tale correctly, um, that change happened in the late 17s or early 1800s uh, that a trench was being dug, I believe it was for water. So they just picked up the stones and they moved them and they replanted them and they kept digging. So know that that kind of stuff absolutely happens. Um, and it, our idea of historic preservation, the way we think about things now, 
the idea of putting things back into their original order and their, the way they originally looked, whether it's landscapes or architecture or art or whatever the case may be, um, is a relatively new concept that I would put very firmly in the 20th century in terms of being a mainstream idea. So gravestones originally had two parts. They had headstones and they had footstones. So if you bury father and he's six foot tall, there will be a six foot spread between his headstone and his footstone. If you bury mother next to him and she's five feet tall, a headstone at the head of the grave and a footstone at the foot of the grave will mark that five foot spot in between her burial. So if we follow that logic and we apply it to this picture from the old burial ground, we can assume that the big stones on the left are the headstones and the little ones on the right are the footstones and that everybody was the same height. In person, this is usually the part where we laugh about that crazy idea. But what it really shows is another, another visual cue that this space has been reorganized. Isn't the space between the big stones and the little stones just the right size for the lawnmowers to go through? You don't want to be the guy that has to mow around all of these big and little stones that are scattered all over the landscape. So that's one thing. So there's another clue for you that this has changed. Um, the idea of the footstone, like I said, you know, this is the idea of your metaphorical bed for eternity. So that little footstone, if we're lucky, gets to stay with its parent and in, may get put out into its own row, like we see here on the right. It might get tucked up against the parent stone. Uh, and if we're not so lucky, off they go. And they end up in all kinds of places. They end up in patios and walkways and brick walls. And I've seen them in, in drains and windowsills and propping up other gravestones. Um, and, and it's not as much of a we may ascribe that to being a thing about being disrespectful, but it's really more about being good Yankees and we reuse what it is that we have over time. So the footstone will have something in common with the headstone. So if that first one over here on the left, where my pointer is, if that's my gravestone and it has my name and it says Brenda P. Sullivan, then this little guy directly behind it should have my initials or my name or something that ties the big one to the little one. So if the big one doesn't match the little one, that's just another clue for you that this space has indeed been reorganized. Even so at the time, these kind of landscapes show up in colonial New England around really looking this way around the last quarter of the 1600s and into the 1700s. And the folks at the time are very religious, they're very superstitious, they're really following the Bible to the letter. Um, and even the way the stones are laid out in the burial ground have a meaning to it and have a distinct purpose. They're on what's called an east-west axis orientation. So it's just a fancy way of saying the way they are placed in the ground. And if you'll notice on my slide in the lower left, I've got a little arrow pointing to the west and on the lower right side, I've got a little arrow pointing to the east. So you can, you might be able to tell that where the sun is positioned in the sky, I am there in the afternoon, which is also a really good time to go take pictures of these because if they are still in their original east-west axis orientation, the sun will be on the faces of the stones and they'll be very ripe opportunities for good picture taking. Because what we are looking at here with these big headstones, what we're looking at is the back. So the writing is on the other side facing the sun or facing west. The body is behind the gravestone here. And the idea is the Archangel Gabriel at the end time on Judgment Day, he was going to come from the east, sounding his trumpet, announcing the call of resurrection, and all the dead are going to sit up in their graves facing east to meet their maker. So this is an important call. You want to be ready for it because you might miss it otherwise. They're very literal in the interpretation of, of the South idea of being saved. So you go into the grave and you wait for that call. So if you came into this burial ground and 
the, the writing isn't facing west, then it's another clue to you that this space has been changed around over time. Look at this beauty. Oh my goodness, I love living in New England. So this is a very standard, very traditional colonial New, e colonial New England slate gravestone. Um, in most of New England, and never say never, because there are other parts that don't have as much slate, but we have a lot of slate that runs through the New England area. And it becomes the, the easily available and readily used material for making gravestones. So gravestones have parts just like anything else. Over here on the left, that first little round is called a shoulder. And then this lunette here with that fabulous image in it is called the tympanum. And then over here on the right, I've got another shoulder. So I've got three lobes or tripartite, just a fancy way of saying there's three pieces to it. Below the art, on the tablet, we typically have the biographical information, who it is, how old, when they were born, maybe when they died, how they died, basic kind of information about the, the occupant or the owner of that gravestone. And like I said, these start coming into the landscape commonly last quarter of the 1600s and going forward. Prior to that, if we were using anything, if the Puritans were using anything for marking the graves, they were uh, using rough stones or wooden markers. And certainly over time, those wooden markers would have been lost. If they stay outside, they would have been lost to decay. Look at all these fabulous faces. I get asked a lot about what was on the minds of these people. Who put skulls on gravestones? Well, the folks of the 17th and 18th century did. They did it because, again, very religious, very superstitious, really following the Bible to the letter. So you put up these stones and they are a picture language to, to continuously nag the population about mortality and morality. These are permanently, and quotate permanently, they are regularly on the landscape. They're typically in the burial grounds in the middle of town where you're passing by. And they are meant to stand there and do the eternal puritanical finger wag about mortality and morality. Life for the people of the time was very difficult. They spent a lot of time just trying to survive. And they understood that they lived with death and it was an omnipresent, inevitable, inescapable specter, always just around the corner and could take you at any time. You had one immortal soul that was your job to take care of it by your actions and words while you were here. So all the deeds you did counted towards the, the salvation or the damnation of, of that immortal soul. And we use the skull on gravestones to denote the idea of being mortal. At the time, because we are very stringently following the letter of the Bible, uh, to carve something into stone that looked human or angelic, if it looked like a heavenly host or looked like a human, as a way of depicting being human, it would have been considered a graven image and would have been sacrilegious. So we use the bones to show the idea of mortality because that is what is left when we die. This soul representation is called a death's head or a winged skull. Um, the idea that the soul is going to take flight to the next world. And these are all, a wing skull is a wing skull in its meaning, but they're going to look different depending on who carved them. Each carver had their own particular style. Some changed their style over time. Others carved the same style through their entire career. And this is but a, a microscopic example of the number of really fabulous wing souls, uh, wing skulls, those death heads found in the old burial ground in Lexington. We get all sorts of puritanical messages on gravestones and I just couldn't stop myself from adding great messages here that I found at the old burial ground. Up in the left hand corner, over that wing skull is a Latin phrase, memento mori, remember death, think on death, remember your mortality. So this is a constant ongoing message to the living about their mortality and their morality. We do it in Latin, 
we do it in written words, written English words on the stones, and we do it in pictures. So we reach those that are educated, those who can just read and write, and those who cannot. And it's a constant visual cue to check your behavior. Are you doing the good work for the care and feeding of your mortal soul? And we have other, um, other messages. Uh, these are not in Latin, but they're all really great examples from the old, old burial ground. In the upper right-hand corner, I've got youths forever lips dot soon, soonest nips. So the idea, death can take you at any time. Death can take you when you're young. Below that, way down below, half on the bottom of each of those columns, on the left, life, how short, right side, eternity, how long. Life is very short, but death is forever. Uh, on the lower left, there's another memento mori over that soul, and it, and really beautifully done, and I hope you can see it, but along the borders, let me throw my cursor on it there. Along the borders, you see that banner, and it says, from death's arrest, come over to the other side, no age is free. And then, you know, don't worry about it. Death is, death's going to happen, but it isn't a permanent condition. Lightly inscribed across the top of the stone on the lower right says, the grave is God's hiding place. So I equate this sort of as God's waiting room. We're going to die. We're going to be put in the grave and we're there and we are waiting for something very specific. We are waiting for judgment day. The call of Gabriel's trumpet sounding the call to resurrection, redemption of our sins, and hopefully ascending to the next world. Down below that, that handsome skull is both death and mortality. It has a dual image. And it says, all must submit to the king of terrors. Death was known as the king of all terrors and all must submit. Some famous guy in the 20th century says, nobody gets out of here alive, but they knew that hundreds of years before that song happened. So don't despair, keep reading. Through Christ, we conquer, rise and reign forever. The promise of more to come after this world. There are other symbols be besides those winged skulls on old colonial New England gravestones. These are both from the Robins and the old burial ground in Lexington. Uh, under on the upper left, under that really fabulous winged skull, I've got crossed bones on either side. And fun fact, those are the long bones of the leg. Those are upper thigh bones. Uh, in between those, if you want to work on the way out, in the very middle under the jaw, of that wing skull is an hourglass. So everybody had an hourglass. You had a certain amount of sand. You didn't know how long you had before that sand ran out, but it could at any moment and you were to be ready for that. And then work your way out from there. Those two cool looking objects on their sides are actually caskets. They are called toe pincher caskets. And you can, what you see butted up against the hourglass is the top of the casket. And then it comes down to fit the body and then it comes down again, it's very skinny at the bottom and hence pinches your toes when you're in there. Uh, down below that, I've got a fabulous scythe, the tools of the reaper. In the upper right hand corner, all must die. That's a pretty obvious phrase, right? Let's cut right to the chase and give you the facts. And then it says his glass is run and there is your hourglass again. Down below that, you put wings on that hourglass, and it is the idea, literally, that time flies. And the sentiment below that chinny chin chin says, as time doth fly, our death draws nigh. Little haiku there for you. As we come into the 1700s and 1720s and 30s, there's a great awakening that happens. Um, it's coming over to us through our religion. It's coming over to us from England. And it is the idea that, yes, death is omnipresent. Yes, life is hard. Yes, we still have to worry about the care and feeding of that immortal soul. But now, as modern people, we can use a more modern symbol. So that symbol of mortality, that winged skull, can grow some skin and take on a human or angelic look 
without now running the risk of being considered a graven image. And I've got a good number of handsome devils on the screen here, again, from the old burial ground. Um, on the right-hand side, the fabulous fellow in the cameo um, has got wings on him. And then I've got two more images below that. Uh, on the lower left, again, in the circle like that, I refer to that as a cameo. But the guy on the right in the little niche, he is doing something very specific. He is peeking out at you from the casket. He is peeking out at you from the grave. This is an important part to know that these might look like people, but they are not meant to be the individual in the grave. Again, carvers carved in particular styles and, and, uh, it, and we'll repeat that so that you may travel from one cemetery to another and, and in their old burial ground, you see somebody that looks like uh, the fabulous man on the left with the curly hair. Uh, that's how you identify carvers really more so than identifying the individual occupant that that gravestone is for. As we come into the close of the 1700s, there's a lot of big changes happening. Uh, we have told the, the guy across the pond, the king, hey, thanks. It's been really great working with you and, and being your subjects, but we're going to strike out on our own and we have a revolution. Out of that revolution, the founding fathers are looking for ideology to build this new nation on. So they look back to the very old and the very successful civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans who were the founders of the concepts of democracy and the Republic, the idea of the people governing themselves. And while they are working on that ideology, there is real time archeology span going on in places like Pompeii and Herculaneum in Italy. Different cities in Greece are being excavated and certainly and the far reaches of the Roman outposts across Europe are also being dug up, being excavated, and the contents of the lives of those ancient civilizations are coming to light for the first time. So when we adopt, in the land of the living, when we adopt the art and architecture and the styles from these classical civilizations, it's called neoclassicism. It's a revival. So it goes into our art, it goes into our, it, it infects in the land of the living, it affects our architecture. We're building buildings with pediments, triangular tops called pediments and columns and capitals, and we're making them look like Greek and Roman temples. Um, it, it presents itself in federal furniture. It presents itself in, in clothing and hairstyles of the time. And what happens in the land of the living happens in the land of the dead as well. And what would be a more perfect symbol for this neoclassicism than a cinerary urn? And that's what that image is meant to be in the upper right hand corner. They were finding actual cinerary urns in their excavations for the Greeks and the, and the Roman culture. And it was where you put the remains of the body, whether it was through natural decay or through cremation. So it's a perfect modern symbol for the time to be on the face of a gravestone. So the wing skull and the wing soul by the time we get into the 1800s has gone by. And I will tell you that as we come through the 18, 1700s where we have both the skull, the wing skull and the wing soul, they exist together. Uh, you can't say the wing skull stopped being used in 1739 because that's just not how it works. One symbol eventually fades out, the other one becomes more dominant, and eventually that those they fade out altogether. And by the time we come into the 19th century, that cinerary urn is the dom one of the dominant symbols on colonial on 19th century New England gravestones. And we also have trees. We've had trees on on uh, colonial gravestones earlier. I've seen them represented, but this is a particular tree. So on the left, I've got a weeping willow. And the idea of the willow, by the way it looks and what its name is, is a perfect example for, it's a perfect symbol for sorrow and mourning. And of course, trees are like living people. 
they have a definite beginning, they have a definite end, and that life is fragile and that can life can be interrupted at any time. I want you to look closely at the example I used here uh, from Lexington. You'll see that there's a split in the tree, but right there in the middle, those two little extra scribe marks that the cutter put in is meant to be the idea of a life springing from that split. It's the death in this life, the end of the tree in this life, but from that death, new life sprouts. So I have them, I have them singularly, the urn and the willow by themselves on the tops of gravestones. And I also have them like down below here um, together. They become the dominant symbol as we work our way through the 1800s. Uh, the idea of the, the tree being something living, the urn being representative of something dead. So a definite beginning and an end like human life. And I wanted to include this one too over on the right because it's just such a lovely variation. Um, there's the urn, but can you see the little tree? That little beautiful weeping willow inscribed on the urn itself means the same thing, just a different artistic expression and a lovely find. As we come through the 1800s, we have an industrial revolution, so more big changes in our culture and in our country. Um, we are moving from being an agrarian culture to being an industrialized nation. We are leaving the farms. We're going to work and live in the cities. We're working in the factories. The mechanizations of those factories are making our lives easier. We are not spending every day just trying to survive the way the people before us were. And because of that, we are living this good life in the land of the living. And remember, it's a relative term, of course. I'm not saying that 16 days, 16 hours a day in a factory, six days a week in the 19th century was a picnic, but life is definitely different. So as modern people, under all these changes, we look at the way we, the people before us, buried their dead in those graveyards with those dark and scary stones. And, and we say, no, no, that is not who we are. We are enlightened, we are modern, and we are going to treat our dead differently as modern people. So in comes the idea of the cemetery. Cemetery comes from a Greek word that means sleeping place or dormitory. It reflects the idea of the time, how people felt about mortality and, and dying. This is now more the idea of passing away, falling asleep, going to the summer land, no more being hatcheted down and moldering in the ground and being eaten by words, worms, which is sentiment that we hate see on colonial New England gravestones. Um, and so this space, this beautiful green space comes into being. And this is Mount Auburn Cemetery. It was established in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. It is located between Cambridge and Watertown. It's started at about 75 acres. It's now about 175 acres. It takes its cues from places like the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. It takes its cues from English gardens of the time are very popular, the idea of open green space and meandering around through the, through the green grass and over the pathways and past the trees and the ponds. It reflects the idea of how people are feeling about nature. You've got the, the poets and the writers of the time, the Hawthorns, Thoreau's, um, Longfellow, Byron, writing about nature, communing with nature, preserving nature, you have the transcendentalists and the spiritualists of the time that are having their seances and using their Ouija boards to commune with the dead. You have all of these things coming into play that as modern people, we want to do something different for our dead. So when Mount Auburn is first opened in 1831, it kicks off the rural garden cemetery movement of the 19th century. And it becomes very much a tourist attraction, exactly as it is today. Even people that did not have people buried in these spaces were coming to see because it was open green space four miles outside of downtown, dirty, filthy, industrialized 19th century Boston. 
It is an oasis and everything about it is different, including the monuments themselves, their shapes and sizes and materials. Here is an example in Monroe, in Lexington, in the Monroe Cemetery of a 19th century cemetery. The idea catches on very quickly and towns everywhere, towns and cities everywhere scramble to lay out this new type of burial space. In these new burial spaces, this is the first time we have the opportunity to actually purchase a piece of land called a family plot. So there is an example of that in the top picture. And very often we will do something to that family plot that shows this is our piece of land. So we might do something like this, put curbing or coping down. We put down a foundation that marks the spot. And this is very much like a home away from home. Right? You can see there that there is a, a front entryway, like a front door, the same way you would walk into the door of your house. It has the family name on it. It tells you whose lot it is. And it really is the idea that the family spends its time living together in this world. And then one by one, they die and they go to the family plot and the family will eventually be reunited in that space. When you have the, this idea of the family plot, and I buy a plot in the new cemetery and my neighbors buy a new plot and someone else and someone else all buys a family plot. When you look across the landscape, you get what you have as an example in the picture below. Also from, these are both from the Monroe Cemetery. You get the idea of the neighborhood. The cemetery of the 19th century was a very social space. You didn't go there just on special occasions and, uh, you know, anniversaries or, or holidays or something like that. You went very regularly, you visited your dead, you visited with the living neighbors, you packed your picnics and you went and you enjoyed the space. Much softer symbols of the time, these nods to nature. There is a whole language of flowers that takes place uh, during the 19th century, which is a whole nother lecture all by itself. But it's the same, we use flowers, we put flowers on the tree, on the, the stones, the same way we put trees on the stones. So, because flowers are like trees, they're both like human lives. They have a definite beginning, a definite end, and those stems are fragile and that, that stem can be broken and that life can be interrupted at any time. On the left, I have the idea of the flower that starts, blooms, and then fully opened, eventually that bloom fades. So it's the idea of the passage of life. If you look on the right of that, it's a little hard to see, but I'm gonna point at it and then I'm gonna talk some more about the material itself. But that little beeble right there, and there's two more here. Those are flowers too, but those are buds. So it is the idea of the flower that started, it was a bud, but that flower that never got to open, that bud that never got to bloom, and the idea of a life cut short or being nipped in the bud. Other nods to nature that I found out amongst the landscape in the Monroe Cemetery are tree monuments. So that one that says Benny on it is a log on its side. And then the one on the right with the scroll on it is an upright log and actually even looks like it's sitting on a stone foundation but that whole thing is carved to look that way. Um, they are all, all of these, both the trees certainly, but all of these are made out of marble. Marble is a new material, newly available. So we have waterways and railroads and we ha even have ships that can bring material from place, marble from places like Carrera, Italy or from the South or from, the, from Vermont or from the West, uh, points further West. And, we were always able to get it, but now we can get it more readily and it can be used for things rather than just big impressive monuments and buildings. It can be used for more regular everyday purposes like gravestones. So when that cemetery landscape becomes the cemetery of the 19th century, we change the monument shapes and sizes and change the material to marble. And it was marble was chosen because it was white and bright. So in and of itself is symbolic. So it's symbolic of heaven and purity, and it very much fits the vernacular of the Victorians in the 19th century. And the problem with marble is 
it is calcium carbonate. So it is all those little wee beasties in the ocean that, that die and float to the bottom and then they all get compressed together to make limestone and more pressure makes marble out of the limestones. And they are very, that material is very loose in its grains. So it is very susceptible to weathering and erosion. And uh, it's also very porous. So it will absorb the atmosphere, the, the pollutants in the atmosphere, and it causes it to further erode, causes it to discolor, uh, and also causes the acid in the, in the atmosphere, in the rain and in the atmosphere, causes a chemical reaction that makes the salts leak out, leach out of the stone and creates a black crust. It's called soluble salt. Um, the good news is they can be cleaned and do not go clean anything until you know what you're doing. And that's very important. Uh, but know that they can be cleaned and they can be returned to a, a wider, brighter look than we see in a lot of cases. Um, but once they are eroded, the imagery is gone. So when you walk into these 19th century cemeteries and you see the marble stones, use your mind's eye to picture what they would have looked like when those monuments were new and fresh, bright white and very crisp and clean in its carvings. Much softer symbols. So in addition to the flowers and trees, we have all kinds of other symbols in the 19th century. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, I have an anchor. Uh, anchor is a symbol of hope. It is the hidden cross to the, to the early Christians. And you may be able to read that under that anchor, it says father. So maybe this was used as, as the father was the anchor of the family. Down below that, I've got a wreath. So there's the idea of, of uh, ivies and oak leaves and other florals that may make up a wreath. Wreaths are typically circular. And so the idea of the circle, no beginning, no end, birth, life, death, rebirth. And um, below that, we've got a sheath of wheat. So symbolic of the harvest, uh, the idea of the life that has come all the way through to the end to the harvest. Up above, we've got little Anna, Anna L. Um, that is a lamb. It's a little hard to tell because he's kind of melty and unfortunately it happens, but that, at one time was a crispy little lamb, maybe even had ears in the face. And um, lambs were used for young children, very often, and young people, but definitely young children. And you'll notice that this little girl only made it to the age of eight weeks. So lambs are symbolic of innocence and purity. In the upper right-hand corner, there are my oak leaves. So there is my nod to nature as well as you can see there are acorns on those oak leaves. So oak typically, and remember never say never, but typically used for men, the mighty oak of the family. And the idea of the acorns can be the concept of offspring. And you might find as in this example, we've got a couple of acorns that are still in their caps. And we've got a couple of acorns that are caps only no acorns. So this may or may not, it's not necessarily, we take it so literally that there were four children and two of them died. That's not really how that goes. Um, but the idea of offspring and maybe the idea of the empty caps is that they're the grown offspring, but the idea that the acorn leaves the tree and goes off and has its own existence. And down below that, this is a kind of tough one to see because the, the marble is so dirty. But in profile, there is my butterfly. So there's the, the buggy bug, his little antennas, and then his wings. So the idea in, the, in this life, you are the, you are the butterfly in the, in the chrysalis. And on the next life, that chrysalis opens and the butterfly sprouts its wings. And and comes out and takes on its new form. And certainly down below, I've got examples of books, the closed book on the left, the open book on the right. These can be the idea of the book of life. They might be the Bible, um, sometimes written on the cover or written on the open pages. You might find the words Holy Bible, and then you'll know what it is. Or you might find a passage, a biblical passage or other writing, 
or you might find the name of the person themselves. If you're looking for me, this is the way we're going straight up that pointing finger says that's where we're going. And that's a really great idea. Um, and it is it is the modern symbol of the 19th century pointing the way to the next world. But that pointing finger is no different than the winged skull and the winged soul we start, saw in the colonial period. The idea that that winged skull, that winged soul was flying off to the next world. Well, this pointing finger is exactly the same thing. It shows the way to go. And it is the promise that there's more on the other side. There's something else after this. And it shows you where I've gone and where we will go. And certainly the shaking hands, goodbye in this life, hello in the next life. Often we'll see shaking hands. Uh, and when you read the stone, you might have a husband and wife. They're often, shaking hands are often a symbol of matrimony. Sometimes we see them with really lovely cuffs looking like, like dress shirts or blouses. Um, here it looks like there's kind of coming out of the cloud. So the idea of passing on, being greeted by those who have gone before you and joining them. You've got a couple of really great objects on the landscape around Lexington. I want you to know about them. These are hill tombs. So these are both in the old burial ground. They are tombs and they got built into hills. So the upper left, that brick facade, you can just see on the far left, you can just see the curve of the land. And then actually at the end, all the way to the right, what you're actually looking at sticking up there is the backside of the tomb in the picture on the lower right. So they're all, they're all connected in a row. Um, so what these are is those facades they hold up, they help hold up the earth. And behind that, in that mound that you see under the under the sod is a vault. So it, it's a, a semicircular. Uh, it might be made out of brick. It might be made out of stone, but there is a chamber underneath that. So you went through on the brick one in the upper left, the, the square on the top is, is a piece of slate that would have the, the information on it, whose family tomb, maybe the names on it. And then the, the larger tablet below is actually the opening that was, that's the door. Um, and on the lower right, you can see under the, under the tablet, uh, under that lintel that has the family name on it, lock, and it also says 1844. Underneath that is the door. So a couple of things. Know that these very possibly have been changed over time. Um, in the upper left, those brick facades, they may have um, gone farther down into the ground so that you would walk, you would have a full-size door and you'd walk down the stairs to then go through the door. Or perhaps not, you might have passed, someone went in and then you passed the casket through that. Um, so they, they could go either way. They are, I see them very often mounted up and, and closed off, um, particularly like you see on the bottom right. So the caskets go inside this structure and goes inside the vault into that chamber and then are just stacked on the floor. They might have racks on the walls to keep them up off the floor, but they were not in put into a grave. They go into this vault and then the doors close behind them. And eventually um, I find that these are either sealed up uh, with, the, with the remains inside or they might take the remains out of them and move them someplace else and then close them up. These guys need maintenance and without maintenance, they can be very unstable. So, and I'm gonna go out on a limb with that, with the bricks over there. Cause I think you might ask me this later. Um, they are, they look to be four individual mounds. I do not think that they are one giant mound all connected, but I don't know, haven't been inside. There's a couple other things on landscape I want you to know too in terms of tombs. So in the upper left, I have a hill tomb that has a box tomb on the top of it. And down below that, I have another what looks to be, because it's mounded like that, I'm taking them for hill tombs, um, that has a table stone 
on it. So let's focus on the objects themselves, the box tomb and the table stone. The idea here, this goes back to, to Europe and in the big churches or in the churches period, um, typically there were crypts under the church. And that is where the ministry went. That is, that's where the patrons bought their way in. All the rest of you riffraff, you all go outside because that's prime real estate. So when I see these on the landscape in this country, they are typically an allusion to the idea of the altar in the church because the altar is over the crypt. When I see these for people in this country, uh, particularly in New England, though those flat slabs, the top of the table and the top of the box is typically where the inscription is. They are very often for our members of the clergy and or founding fathers or important members of the community from the time period. They are not there with all that inscription to say, look how great I was. They are there with all that inscription to say, I was a leader of the community. I tried to set an example, particularly in the case of the ministry, the clergy, if there's somebody you're supposed to, that's supposed to help get you through this life and to guide you to the next world, it would be the minister being a conduit between this world and the next. And that's what that table stone is on the bottom. Um, that is the family tomb for the minister that I wish I could see his name, but my my Zoom is, is obscuring it, but I know you can see it. Um, two more things and we'll move on. One, do not let anyone tell you that there is a box inside, a body inside that box in the upper left. Box tombs did not contain bodies. The bodies were still buried, or in this case, I believe these are both hill tombs. Um, those boxes might just be four pieces of marble and hollow inside with the, with the slab on the top or they might have a, a brick or stone center and then the finishing slabs of marble put around them. Fun fact with the, with, when you see the table stones like down below, um, get on your knees and look underneath. Be careful, they can be unstable, but look underneath. Oftentimes I have found that the slab gets reused. So it might be reinscribed later on or we just used uh, an existing piece of stone that was already carved and we flipped it over and recarved it for this purpose. I need you to know about these too because I found this in Monroe. This is a mausoleum. So this is definitely your home away from home. It is a freestanding structure. You'll notice it has a, a hearkening to neoclassicism in its pediment, its, um, its columns and capitals. This was just like home, the idea that the family would arrive, they'd walk down the front lawn, they'd go up onto the, the up the stairs and onto the porch, they'd put the keys in those beautiful doors and they'd open it up into a chamber like you see on the right. This is all above ground, this is all self-enclosed. This is what you see when you look inside. Uh, this, this whole interior is marble. These niches, there are three on each side. So this sleeps six and they are horizontal. So you put the casket horizontally into the niche and you closed it usually with, with something rough like plywood or something or wood. And then you put the, the finishing piece of marble over it. Um, this is very much the home away from home. You might've had a table and chairs in here. You would come and visit and bring flowers and sweep and maybe sit and read your newspaper or, or go sit and read your book, commune with the dead, commune with, uh, with nature. Um, these structures also very often have windows like we see here, stained glass windows. Having a window makes it just that much more like the house. It lets in the light and it also is the idea of also being able to look outside. Those, those stained glass windows uh, often will have a religious motif to them, or like in this case, we've got a beautiful outdoor scene with flowers and, and very much the idea of being able to look out the window to the landscape beyond. Need you to know about these. These are called white bronze. They are affectionately known as Zinkies. I found this family plot in the Monroe Cemetery in Lexington. They, uh, this particular monument and all the little 
I call them pillow stones, all those little ones around it were made by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut between the last quarter of the 1800s and into the 1900s. Uh, they were a direct response from Monumental Bronze to stone monument makers as well as bronze monument makers. Bronze is a very popular material at the time and it's got a lot of prestige to it because it's expensive. We have bronze plaques, bronze vases, or vases, I guess they're expensive, um, bronze doors, bronze statuary. So they have a lot of, they have a lot of cachet. They, they are very much a status symbol. And the problem with bronze is it needs maintenance. So it, and it's expensive. So if you put bronze outside and you don't do any maintenance, it doesn't take very long before the elements cause chemical reactions that cause them to oxidize and they turn green or black, they get streaky and they're, they're not lovely anymore. So they have to be maintained. So Monumental Bronze came up with the marketing name of this new marker called white bronze. It's neither white nor is it bronze. It's that pale blue gray. And now that you know what they are, when you see them on the landscape anywhere, you will be able to spot them because they're very obvious. Um, they are neither white nor are they bronze. They are almost pure zinc. And it was smelted at the foundries in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The molten zinc was poured into molds and then the molded pieces were assembled to make the finished product. The idea of this was they, they called it white bronze to, to capture the cachet of the word bronze and called it white bronze to be able to say it needs no maintenance like bronze does. Once it goes out on the landscape, that's how it's always going to look. And it has nothing in it that's going to corrode uh, or have any kind of chemical reaction. So it's always going to look like this. Zinc is a natural biocide. So it isn't going to grow lichens and mosses and algaes. And it is a newfangled thing at the time. So it's very modern. You have the opportunity to purchase these from salesmen that have design books. So they're highly customizable as well. So everything about this is brand new. When you see these guys on the landscape, walk over and just knock on them gently. If someone answers, run. But more likely, what's going to happen is that it will return a hollow metallic sound because it is metal. They are zinc. And there is no internal armature to these. They are, they are completely hollow. There's no structure holding them up inside. Monumental bronze made these from, like I said, the last quarter of the 1800s and into the 19 teens. Um, I do see them afterwards a little bit, um, but mostly they, they fell out of, of fashion because the raw material in the factory was needed for the First World War effort. And one more thing you need to know, that whole thing is uh, the pieces are all uh, molded together. Uh, with molten, each of the individual pieces are, are put together with molten zinc. But these panels here where my pointer is, those are the information panels. So they're going to say the name of the people. Those are bolted on so that if you wanted to change it afterwards, you want to add somebody, you don't have to, you're not stuck with an unchangeable monument. You can have it updated by having just the new panels cast and reattached to the monument. So this is the modern landscape. It's also in Monroe Cemetery in Lexington. So when you look across the landscape, you can see the 19th century influence and you can see the modern influence as well. This is our third and most modern period. It really looks different from everything that we've seen so far. It is a, it is a point in time where we, again, we have a lot of change going on. We've come through the industrial revolution of the 19th century. We're rolling into the 20th century and mechanization and invention is propelling us to being modern people like no one before us. And things really change. And two of the, there's a bunch of things that cause this to happen, that, that cause this landscape to happen. So there is a, a backlash against the, the Victorians of the 19th century after Queen Elizabeth dies in 1901. 
within a couple of years, we get an arts and crafts movement that comes to us from England. And again, it influences the land of the living in our architecture and our furniture, in our mode of dress. We want to relax a little. We want to calm down from the over ornamentation, the high sentimentality, the, the frenetic pitch that really marks just about everything of the Victorian period. Um, so we want to return this land of the dead to a more pastoral look as we look across the landscape. So we have more uniform shapes and sizes in our markers. We have newly available material in granite. Granite geologically is molten from the core of the earth. So it's very hard. And our modern tools of the time, starting with pneumatic tools, so water powered or steam powered tools, allow us to get this very hard material out of the ground. And again, we've, uh, we've been able to get it, but now we, uh, we don't use it just for big impressive monuments and buildings. Again, it can be adapted for more everyday use for things like gravestones. Um, the landscaping in the modern cemeteries will dictate how the land looks. We have to think about keeping the grounds looking good, both from a financial point of view and from a, an efficiency point of view. And two of the biggest things that I think impact on top of all of that is that we start we stop living with death the way the people that lived before us did. So we have modern medicine. Medicine moves very quickly from science, from art to science as we move out of the 1800s and into the 1900s. And if you think about how quickly medicine, it just in the last 100, 120 years has, has moved. We went from understanding um, about germs and bacteria and viruses and how disease was spread. We understood how to keep our water clean so they didn't make us sick. We learned how to, we understood how to um, keep our food so it didn't spoil and still taste good without all that salt. And so that it didn't make us sick. And, and really now, if you think about modern, techno modern medical technology, you can have new organs put in. And if you wait just a little bit, pretty soon they're gonna be printing you 3D organs. You're not gonna to have to wait for transplants. We are mapping our human genome. We are, we are editing our genome to correct for genes that, are, that have gone bad or that malfunction and that cause different types of diseases. So we cheat death on a very, very regular basis. And we don't go here as much. We don't talk about death the way the folks that lived before us experienced it and made it part of their everyday conversation. And we also, we have another big change in that during the Civil War, we get embalming. And then from there, we stop dying at home and we stop caring for the dead in our home. You now get sick, you go to the hospital, you, you may die in a facility rather than at home. Your family no longer prepares the body and dresses it for viewing because you don't have the wake in the house anymore. You have a funeral director that comes and takes the body rather quickly, in many cases, takes the body away and prepares it away from us because we now deem this a rather unpleasant thing to have to ex experience death. So the funeral director works to do all the arranging and also works to give us back a body that looks as lifelike as possible. So all of this comes together to make us as modern people show on the cemetery landscape what we think about death and memorialization. So a lot of the stones that I've seen in the, from the 20th century in particular uh, didn't have a lot of information. They had names and dates and not much else. I will say that in, in the last 30 years or so, I have seen a movement for individuals and families for individuals that die. They wanna say something about who they were. So we put a lot more imagery and information on our gravestones. So now I can go through the cemetery gates and meet somebody, put air quotes around that, um, that I would have existed contemporaneously with, but might not have had a chance to meet due to the limitations of time and space. We have a couple other landscapes, uh, new modern cemetery landscapes. This is Westview. This is the Lawn Cemetery. This is in Lexington. 
And as you can see, there are no above ground markers. That's what a lawn cemetery is. So it takes the idea of maintaining that pastoral image, the idea of that, that easy pastoral landscape as you look across the grounds, uh, and they have no upright markers. All the markers are flush. And so it, it has one type of aesthetic, and also it lends itself to, to easier, more efficient landscaping. Also in Lexington, you have this right out behind the UCC. It's very nicely juxtaposed with the old burial ground. Um, this is a memorial garden. It is, this picture when I was there, it was either late fall or maybe early spring. So it doesn't look so lovely, but when it's, when it's spring and summertime, it's in bloom, it's a really lovely little meditative space. Um, it was created in September of 2000, so it's 20 years old now. And you'll see on the right, we've got little memorial stones there. And there's that doesn't mean that we have interments there of any variety. What it is, is a memorial garden. So those bricks were purchased. The money was money goes to doing the, the maintenance and the, the creativity of the garden. And then it puts the name and dates of, of your loved one there as a memorial for you to go and visit um, and for other people to see and maybe remember as well. A few other things we met along the way I need you to know about. Um, certainly, as the cradle of the revolution in Lexington, you guys have a gravestone in the old burial ground for the first eight militiamen to fall on the, the Battle of Lexington Green on April 19, 1775. That monument, that gravestone is still in the old burial ground. And then in 1799, the common monument and tomb was erected, and in 1835, those eight militiamen were moved to this tomb on the green. When you come into Lexington and you see Captain John Parker, you see the Minuteman there on the stones, that fabulous bronze statue. Um, he has he has a monument um, to him in the old burial ground. Uh, it's sort of got a, 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 an obelisk shape to it, albeit a rather squat one. Um, and it is uh, it is more in the the 18th century, I'm sorry, the 1800s, in the 19th century vernacular. And honestly, I can't say if I know, I do not know if that actually marks his grave or not. I bet, when, I bet my historical society lady can tell me. Um, gravestones will also help you uh, see different things that different diseases and, and troubles that go through a town. And here I have ex uh, three examples of smallpox outbreaks that comes through Lexington, uh, 1760, again in 1778, taking five children from this one family and then six children from another, less than 20 years later. Um, and then marked on the gravestones of the three down below, I'll say direct response to the idea that they died of smallpox. So you can chart all sorts of things that happen um, both from, from a public health point of view as well as personal tragedy based on what you find on the gravestones. And certainly I love this one. And I like to close with this one. I decided I picked him from my archives um, that Mr. Locke, uh, Theodore L. Locke, and this says, he's the third one listed on that obelisk. It says, killed by the falling of a steeple of the Bethesda Church, Charlestown, April 16th, 1851. I've got this magic source called Google. So I Googled to see what I could find. And Bethesda Church was dissolved in 1849, and Mr. Locke was killed by the falling of the steeple when the church was being disassembled. I use this because this is one of my honorary Greystone girls. I use this to close my program um, because she is indeed a Muzzy. So she is very much connected to Lexington, the Muzzy family from the, from the Revolutionary War to fall on the green. She is a descendant. We went out to do, to do uh, some genealogy work for her one day. And she's there smiling behind her ancestral gravestone. And I've been here telling you all of this because we want you to know that cemeteries are fun. They're educational spaces. They are living history and art museums. They are free and open to the public. 
Um, we have the, the broadest range in the Northeast of, of examples and, and oldest, some of the oldest surviving gravestones in the country. So it's dark and it's cold now. And I don't know if it's gonna rain tomorrow, but if it does put on your raincoat and your rain boots and get out there and explore. In this time of pandemic, we are still busy as gravestone girls. Um, this is just a quick little piece of self-promotion to say that this weekend, we are participating in two um, Samhain and Halloween style, spooky haunted oddities driven virtual festivals. And then also on the next two Sundays of November 1st and the 8th, we will be in person with our wares at the Providence Flea in Providence, Rhode Island. And we are actually on the docket for their indoor program, for their indoor markets, uh, all very well managed and COVID safe um, through the rest of November and up through Christmas for your shopping needs. So that is enough shameless self-promotion. I am going to check in with my with my librarian and with my historical society, with Miss Sarah, and see if there's any burning questions you guys have that I can answer. And if not, that's uh, that's okay too. I will add one more thing. Um, there is a on the website, on the Great Stone Girls website, there's a section called Learn. So there's a lot of links to a bunch of other uh, great resources, all kinds of things for other cemeteries and and gravestone carvers and conservationists and everything. Um, we add to that all the time. It's a good resource for you, as well as there's a couple of handouts that you can download and print that are glossaries of terms of symbols uh, and covers a lot of the things that I spoke about tonight. All right, I'll let my, I'll let my Mina Jane talk now. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Wow, that was really fascinating. Um, if you wanna stop your share that we do have some questions. I'd be delighted. I should always open up my, um, oh, actually, I should um, always at the top. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Here we okay. go. Great. I should always preface my, my programs by saying I can talk about this forever. So <laughs> I think I just, well, we'll take, we'll just take a bunch of questions and hopefully be, uh, anyway, so the first question is from Deb. Don't most historians frown on gravestone rubbings? I get asked that all the time. The answer is some of them certainly do. Um, so yeah, so gravestone rubbing is a completely inert process if it is done properly. And that's the key. Most of the reason that it gets prohibited is because it's been done in the past and it's done damage of some variety. So. If you think about if you think about how these objects are out on the landscape 24/7 for literally hundreds of years, one New England winter or certainly one summer of lawnmowers and weed whackers are far more detri detrimental to these objects than a properly gravestone, properly executed gravestone rubbing. Um, there are times that there that that rubbing might be the only thing that's left of that stone. It might, it, and it definitely serves to be a snapshot of that stone at a particular point in time because they do change on the landscape, whether they erode or even just get covered with biological growth that obscures the art and makes them difficult to read. So yeah, part of my Gravestone Girls evangelistic crusade is to, to bust that myth that gravestone rubbing is bad. There are, there are things you need to know and there are rules you have to follow but if you do it properly, there's no reason why it can't be done. And one of them certainly includes getting permission from whoever oversees the burial ground. Thank you. Um, from Facebook, Linda asks, what's the difference between a mausoleum and a tomb? And a tomb? Yeah, so the mausoleum is a freestanding, like I, I showed you with the stained glass and the door and all that. We get a little muddy with the idea of tomb and crypt. We tend to use them interchangeably. Um, I wouldn't say that a mausoleum isn't a variant of a tomb um, because it is a, a, a closed in structure where you, where you put the bodies into. Um, crypts and tombs are 
often underground, crypts often under the church, um, tombs are often objects like catacombs, also again underground. But there's there's certainly definitions for them, but we do tend to use them interchangeably. But a mausoleum is specifically a freestanding architectural structure that looks like that house that we saw. Great, thank you. We I really love that uh, window in there. The stained glass is beautiful. Oh um, yes, they can be absolutely. Tiffany made stained glass for not just churches and and, and private homes and that kind, but for mausolea as well. Wow. So Mike asks, was it simply the headstones and footstones that were moved or the bodies which they presided over as well? I love this question. I get this all the time. Um, put your thinking caps on or, or put your put your seat belts on maybe um, and, and be prepared for the idea that we didn't always move the bodies. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, it's going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on Who's doing the project? Who's doing the moving? Why are we moving them? Um, I live in Worcester and my one of my old colonial burial grounds is located downtown. In the mid 1800s, all the stones were laid flat and covered over so that um, uh, to make way for the trolley tracks. So that was considered progress of the time. It, it sounds like sacrilege to us today with our modern thought process, but it was the idea that, that you needed to make way. Um, there, I have another older, even older than that, colonial burial ground in town that the stones were moved when the new garden cemetery was founded in the 19th century, but the bodies were not. Um, it's going to, yes and no. How's that? Yes and no. And it's, it, when you're moving these kind of things too, it, depending on how old they are, there may not be anything left. Um, we, I hate to say it, but different times, we just don't care. They're, the dead are just in the way and we'll reorganize because it looks good above ground. And then, you know, whatever happens underground, they're dead anyway. So, oh, I know. Yeah. So I mean, Paul, you read the newspapers or you read any, you follow a lot of stuff. It makes the papers when somebody's ex excavating somewhere and they run into a cemetery or we, we expand a parking lot and realize that the parking lot of the playground is over, over an old burial ground. Right. Um, Paula says that she heard that Mount Auburn would not allow the zinc stones in their cemetery. Maybe they weren't good enough. I think I've heard that. I'm doing a quick scan in my head of that 175 acres. I think that's true because I don't recall seeing any. Um, Mount Auburn had and continues to have a lot of rules about what you can and can't do. Um, I don't recall seeing any there. Um, and I know somebody that works there. So now I got to ask the question to see if that, if that is a piece of lore, if that was actually true. Um, you can go into towns and not find um, those, those white bronzes, those zinkies in some towns. And, and it's not necessarily that they were prohibited. Uh, it was the idea that you might not have had a good salesman or you just didn't have anybody that had any interest in purchasing them. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was no um, there was no showroom to go to to see them, so you had to go look at them in situ. You had to go look at them on the on the landscape to see whether you wanted to put your money down and purchase one or not. Um, but it it wouldn't be it, it wouldn't be un uncommon for a cemetery then or now to dictate what you can and cannot do for monuments. But now I got to find out. Now I gotta go ask Corinne and see if if that bit of the tidbit is true or just a piece of lore. Um, so thank you, Valerie says in the museum mausoleum photo you showed, you mentioned that the body is put on the shelves horizontally. I see that the marble slabs that seal the body inside have a handle. Do the slabs have only one handle or are there two? I can't tell from the picture. Handle. Hmm. Uh, I haven't seen any with handles. Uh, now I gotta go back and look. Uh, they don't typically 
have handles on them, but again, never say never because I can think of a number of them. Um, with when you look at the the plaques, the the closures on the hill tombs, often you'll see handles on them, on the on the the, the closures on those hill tombs, and it's because you need to be able to get that front off. Um, with typically what I see inside of mausolea is they are they're flush mounted and it's going to be a stonemason that's putting them on and taking them off so they're going to be put in and then they're going to be um, grouted or cemented in somehow so that they're stable and you're going to have a stonemason if you needed to open these for whatever reason you're going to have the stonemason come in and take that take that mortar out so then you can take the front of it off i'll have to go back and look at that picture again never say never um, but I don't recall that particular one having handles. Okay. But um, also, it can also just be ornamentation too, if you see them. Okay. So Jillian from Facebook asks, um, can you get into, can you still get gravestones engraved with the pictures from the 1700s? You can indeed. Um, on the Gravestone Girls website in that section called Learn that I talked about, we have a list of folks we know that are modern carvers that are carving in the traditional colonial style. So they will make those, those colonial tripartite, you know, the two shoulders and the tympanum shapes. They work in slate. Um, and then you can have them made with any kind of imagery that you like. Um, there are a number of them uh, from here to Maine, from Massachusetts to Maine. Uh, there's a woman in Rhode Island, her name is Karen Sprague, and she actually runs a school you can apprentice under her. She's a master carver. She's been at it for years and is amazingly creative. Um, but you can, she takes a couple of apprentices for at a time uh, for a two year course in learning how to, to cut stones. Mm -hmm. So you can purchase them and there are places that are still working to make them. Okay. Um, how many colonial graves exist in Lexington now and where can we see them? How many colonial graves? Well, good question. I have no idea what the count is. Actually, is that a big lie? Oh, no, wait, that's, I was thinking of another number I saw today for a different space. Um, I think this is probably a good place for you to check out the historical society for an actual possible inventory because these spaces do get inventoried over time. There's a lot of them in there. There's a lot of surviving gravestones. That being said, there are probably a lot more bodies then there are surviving gravestones. So I couldn't tell you what the count is, but there's a lot and right in the middle of Lexington behind the UCC church, right downtown across from the green is where you will find Lexington's oldest burials and oldest gravestones. Okay. Easily stones in the 80s with death date to the 60s. Okay. Um, do flat stones last longer than upright ones? Do people want to visit graves in the winter when the flat stones might be covered with snow? So whether you have a, a, a vertical or a horizontal tablet of some variety, or you have a, 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 a sculpture or whatever, um, that is personal choice. Certainly um, in the modern time, if you are if you are thinking about putting up a gravestone, find your cemetery first. But before you buy your plot, read your read the documents that they'll give you because they got a lot of rules about what they will allow and what they won't allow. Do that. Know what where you're going before you commission a monument, a marker of any variety. Um, and certainly, the whether they're up or down doesn't impact their durability so much as the material that they're made out of. Whether they're, you know, granite is more durable than marble or uh, marble or slate, sandstone is very brittle. You know, it, it's more the, the durability of the monument itself is predicated on the material more so than its orientation. Okay. Um, Sarah just shared um, a map with everybody about the old burying grounds. And so you can click that link and find, uh, you know, where you can explore. Um, Elizabeth says that it's on the Mount Auburn Cemetery website that gravestone rubbing is prohibited. 
Oh, absolutely. So I wouldn't be surprised at all. So that's where you had said, make sure you ask the people that run the place before you even think about doing anything like that. Correct. Correct. The first tenant of you doing gravestone rubbing is you get permission. Um, so a lot of people will say to me, gravestone rubbing is illegal in Massachusetts. It's not illegal. There is no statewide law on the books. There's no legislation that prohibits or allows gravestone rubbing. It is up to whoever oversees the burial ground to determine what they will and will not allow. Some of them are really good about it, like Mount Auburn will put their rules up and say, this is what you can and can't do. And no, we don't want you rubbing gravestones. Um, I've worked with other towns in different places that they will let you do it, but they want you to go to town hall and fill out a form and give them $2 to get a permit and then, and then go. Uh, they want to know that you're out there and, and so they can find you if you do something bad. Well, what I want you to do is learn how to do it right, uh, not just get permission, know how to choose the right stone to work with, um, uh, use the right materials, put a barrier up between the stone and your working surface so that no matter what media you use, if you end up going through the paper for whatever reason, you do not get anything on the face of the stone and then you clean up after yourself. It's not rocket science, but it takes a little bit of thought and some organization. And, and if it's done properly, there's no, in my mind, there is no reason why it can't be done. You will get pushed back from places. Um, there are places that will not allow it, but again, my job is to bust that myth, so. Okay. Evelyn says, um, I heard somewhere that some mausoleum spaces were reused with one person remains removed when the space was needed for another in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is true. I know how that sounds. Um, we, we may tend to think of that just happening down in the South. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the, with the cemeteries in places like Louisiana and New Orleans, the big uprights, um, they are very much on an as need basis. And if you bury, if you put somebody in that grave house and you need that space, well, then that person that was there gets, I know how this is gonna sound, but this is what happens. The, the person that was there um, gets, the, the casket gets broken up, the, the body gets bagged up and at the end of the, um, in the grave house, the, the the slab that they're on inside the house might be, just call it eight feet long. The slab that the body lays on is only takes up six feet. And you've got an extra two feet at the end of that. And below that, there's a charnel pit, basically. So the body gets bagged up and put into that charnel pit. Um, that's just the tradition of doing it down that way. Um, we certainly do have... Uh, I know of churches that have those kind of crypts where you share space and uh, and if it's needed for the family, then you know for the next member, then that is what you do. You may may keep them together in that kind of fashion in that space, or you may take the existing family member out and they get buried somewhere. Um, and also another fun fact: you don't keep up with the rent in some of these places; they will boot you out. Oh. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. Right. So keep paying your bills. You get a cemetery. You, and, and this is in the case of like public, uh, uh, when you don't own the, the space itself. Mm -hmm. um, so Facebook question from Linda. There are some people in modern time now that are being cremated and looking at biodegradable urns. Do mm -hmm. graveyard cemeteries have rules about this? They do. Um, they're called green burials. And it depends on how progressive your location is to, to determine who's adopted what. Um, it was, it's been in place on the West Coast for quite a while. Uh, we are starting to allow it over here in the Northeast. Um, and it is the idea, uh, so green burial is no, no embalming, no, um, no, no vault for the body. Uh, biodegradable caskets, or if you've been cremated, the, the biodegradable urns, um, nothing that can't decay. That's what a green burial is. Um, and it's very popular. So cremation is very popular. 
I read somewhere that it's more than 50% of the of the, the death processing that happens. Uh, and, and the idea of being able to go back into the ground, to go back to nature without leaving some sort of eternal footprint with vaults and caskets and embalming fluids and all that is, is very appealing to some people. The cemeteries are recognizing that and they are either setting aside space for green burials and there's no markers, there's, there's no tombstones like we know them. Um, it keeps really keeps that pastoral look across the landscape. Um, you may plant a tree or whatever to, to mark the spot, but you, you could easily go through it and not realize that, it, that there are burials there. I see them in other places too, that, that the green burial section is in a spot where other uh, in, uh, interred spaces are. Um, they will mix them together. Um, I don't know that I've seen any actual lots. Like if you bought a family plot and it had four spaces, um, I don't know that they're letting you mix and match, but I don't know what everybody's doing. So I, it's entirely possible. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> we have um, one last comment and then one last question. So Elizabeth, who had mentioned about, talked about the um, rub, uh, gravestone rubbing, said at yep. Forest Hill, no speci there's no specific prohibition, but you're supposed to get permission from the family to take pictures of the headstones. So that makes sense too. So um, yeah. there's, if I may, um, so if, <laughs> if they don't want you taking pictures, that means they are a private cemetery. So there are public cemeteries, they are owned and operated by the municipality. And there are private cemeteries that are typically run by a board. Um, they have their own, they have their own money from endowments and from, from lot sales. And they look at um, they look at the members that buy spaces in their cemetery as co-owners and that they have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the privacy of the people. And that can extend to as far as not taking pictures, not allowing photography in the cemetery. I know a number, I know a number of them. I think the best example of that is Swan Point Cemetery in Providence. Uh, it was the first time I had run into it, but I've gone as far as California and been snapping pictures without having any idea that, that it was a prohibited uh, activity and it may be ask the family uh, or or it may just be check in at, at the front gate with the with the directors or in the in the um, office and let them know you're there and that you would like to take pictures but you you do have to be cognizant of these kind of things absolutely and one last question um, which I think is really sweet there's a little cemetery on 443 Mass Ave. Do you know a, a history of this place when it was founded and why it's so small? 443 Mass Ave in Boston? Or in I think in Lexington. Oh, 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 I'm so dumb. Of course. Duh. Um, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> my mind went exactly to Boston. I'm like, Mass Ave. I know a lot about Mass Ave, but I know most know mostly the restaurants. Um I will tell you, I don't, and I don't see my cemetery book around here, but I listed all of the ones that were in the historic record from, from a, a, a reference book that I use a lot. Um, if you've got one there, oh, I think I know where you mean. I think I know where you mean. Um, when they're Typically when they're small like that, they're a family cemetery. So they're a family burial ground. They probably date to the 1700s, but they can be later as well. Um, and it is the idea that early on, it was completely normal, completely accepted to, to bury your own dead on your own property. We held large tracts of land, um, often different, different farms butted each other and they might set aside a common space for those, those abutting families to share burial space. Um, you do it because it was accepted, it was normal, um, and maybe it was too far to go to get to, if you lived in the North Parish and it's several miles by wagon 
to get to the burial ground, well, it's perfectly okay to bury them on your own yard. When we start parceling out that land and we build buildings and we lay out our towns and our cities and, and all of that, those now, those little burial spaces, they may lose their homes that they're, that they're connected to. Those houses may not stand any longer. Um, they might be in a modern home's backyard or in the side yard or on the side of the road uh, or in the middle of nowhere. So when you find them like that, they're typically family cemeteries. And they, if I'm not mixing up my towns, I know where you mean. And I think that that was the Robbins Cemetery. Oh, somebody just wrote that in the um, in the uh, Q and A too. Right, East Lexington near the Toyota dealership. Exactly. <laughs> and um, Elizabeth said in the Q and A that she thought it was the Robin. So we do have people. Good job, Gravestone Girls. Every last one of you. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, so actually, I'm going to ask one last question because this is a good one. Where is the most unique stone you have ever seen? Jillian asks that. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, uh, so many, so many. I have been very, very fortunate to be able to travel in cemeteries around the world. The first one that leaps to mind is, and you can look it up because it's really cool, um, is in Barcelona in, I don't remember the name of the cemetery, but if you Google kiss of death gravestone, that's right up there on the top of my list. Um, but I mean, I've seen, I've seen amazing things in the cemeteries in Paris, you know, you know uh, deathbed scenes, you know, a dead woman in a giant bed with her husband over her. In Vermont, there's a mausoleum where it's got a it's a mother and daughter inside the mausoleum and the, there's a statue of the father kneeling on the stairs you know, like this in his grief and with his hat in his hand. Um, there isn't just a one. And I will tell you that uh, there is a, a cemetery in Genoa, Italy that is on my list. If I could get on a plane right now and go, I would go. Uh, because it's filled of spectacular, spectacular art. But yeah, I don't have a favorite, but I've seen a lot of really cool things. And if you look at the Gravestone Girls Facebook page, um, and even, even our Instagram pages, um, go back through the archives. When we travel, we put a lot of stuff up. So you can see where we've been. And I've been in China. I've been on the West Coast. I've been through Europe. Uh, I haven't seen them all, but I, and my list is still very long, but I've seen a lot of spectacular stuff. Oh, I'm sure. Um, thank you so much, Brenda. This has been fantastic. We've gotten mm -hmm. great comments in both everywhere um, about how much people are enjoying this and learning from it. And um, thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I like following my librarian around. <laughs> down. I'll go with you the next time you take a new job too. And thanks, I Sarah, do. for helping with the historical society stuff. I hope I, I hope I've got people thinking, and they'll come use your great resource because you've yeah, got a lot of you've got the keepers of your town history. So yeah, and so I, I dropped a link uh, in the side. We do have a free phone tour. Oh, if anyone is interested in exploring the old burying ground, and we also do live tours on the weekends. Hooray, I'll be there. <laughs> um, and I will send out a recap to everybody that was here with, um, with the video link, because we did record, and um, all of the resources. And I will post them to Facebook as well. So thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, Sarah, for partnering with us. We always enjoy having you um, show up at our program <laughs> and help out. Brenda, this has been lovely. And um, I have felt that stalkery feel in the back of my head. So I do know that you're there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'm always, I'm, I'm a lurker for sure. <laughs> well, I've learned a lot and I feel like I, I have to visit some of my uh, local grave sites now. Good. That means I did my job. You did. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful night. And thanks again for being here with us. Good night, everyone. Thank you.